All right. Good morning, church. Happy National Day to you. I hope you have a good mid-autumn festival as well. Uh, this makes for a long weekend for many. So for those of you that didn't travel, you're right here in Hong Kong. Really good to see you. Uh, yeah, we ex uh, uh, celebrated mid-autumn festival yesterday, went to the beach. It did not feel like the middle of autumn, though, right? It feels like mid-summer festival. So we need to have another mid-autumn festival like in late November or something when things actually cool off a little bit. So whatever your story is, we're really glad that you're here. I want to welcome you, those that are looking at a three-dimensional speaker here on the first floor, and you two-dimensional people on the second and 10th floor or on the YouTube channel. Uh, glad that you're here. We're in this series called Jesus Asks. Uh, it's a six-week series, and this is week five, where we're looking at uh, the New Testament in the Gospels where Jesus will ask questions to those around him. And we remind ourselves that Jesus never asks a question because he lacks the information. Uh, it is always uh, on behalf of the one he asks it of or to. For them to be reflective, to, for them to go a little deeper, to look into their own heart and to question motives or to uh, understand more fully who they are. And, and that's what uh, we are going to actually see today. Uh, we're going to look into the book of uh, the Gospel of John. Uh, John is one of four Gospel writers, if you remember, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And uh, in the book of John, uh, he has the least amount of miracles that he records, only eight of the total 37 recorded miracles found in the Gospels, uh, John is the least uh, miracle dense, you might say. Uh, Mark has the most, or is the most miracle dense of those four Gospel accounts. And so we're going to look at John's story found in John chapter 5, where he asks this question, do you want to get well? Um, let me tell you, a few years ago, when I was a little more um, wide than I am now, my doctor wisely, shrewdly suggested that I go see a dietitian. And after swallowing uh, my pride uh, and secretly being a little bit um, agitated, I thought, yes, this is a good idea. I'd never been to a dietitian before. So I made my way and got my $1,000 ready to pay uh, to this woman who was surrounded in her office with all sorts of degrees and certificates that said she was well knowledgeable about diet and about health. I, I didn't mis distrust her credentials at all. Uh, but the thing that did make it a little bit hard for me, if I'm honest, is that I sat down across from her and she was probably about my same age. Um, and probably five foot two and 95 pounds. And I thought, you don't get me. Like, you have metabolism. Um, you don't understand what this body is like, right? And, but she's got the credentials. She's the expert. So I listened to her. And she asked me as we just, you know, she did all the body measurements. That's kind of embarrassing. Um, but we did all of that, and then we sat down to review and to come up with a strategy, and she said, do you want to lose weight? And, you know, I was like, I'm here, like, duh. But it was a good question, because the reality, when I thought about it, is no, I don't. I want to be thin, but I don't want to lose weight. <laughs> is there a way to just, like jump there, because she then took me on this plan, this very stringent, strategic, guaranteed weight loss plan, which involved a very small amount of food every day, <laughs> like portions that would just be for a small child, and it involved things like lettuce and kale, nothing fun at all, right? And I started to think, you know, I don't want to lose weight. I just want to be thin. <laughs> Here, Jesus is going to ask what seems like an obvious question to a man who is paralyzed, who hasn't walked for decades. He says, do you want to get well? Duh. But once he thinks about it, perhaps that question is a little more nuanced than it appears on the surface. 
So let's dig in. We're going to look at John chapter 5 and this account of this engagement with a man who is paralyzed. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now, just so you know, there's a variety of different Jewish festivals, seven that occur in a year. Uh, But there was only three of these festivals that involved a pilgrimage going to Jerusalem. Now, we're not told which of these three it is. It could have been Passover, could have been the festival of booths or tabernacles. We're not sure. doesn't matter, except for the fact that we know Jerusalem at this point is crowded more than usual. Now, there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Now, we're told some details, some geographic details. We're told that it's near what is known as the Sheep Gate. Now, that's maybe an odd name for a gate into the city, except for the fact that we know uh, in Jerusalem the shepherds would bring sheep that would then be offered as sacrifices at the temple. And so it is near that gate where they had all of those sheep come that this is taking place. And then he says it is called Bethesda. Uh, Bethesda literally means house of mercy. And there is, we're told, uh, a pool that is there. And it's surrounded by five colonnades or five porches, we we might say. Um, So we continue on. The Jewish festivals, Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles, are the three that involve the pilgrimage to the city. Now, interestingly, it wasn't until 1888 that an archaeologist from Germany by the name of Konrad Schick actually discovered the pool of Bethesda. So fairly recently, this was uncovered. Prior to that, there were tons of critics, cynics, uh, those who were either very liberal in their theology or anti-Christian, would point to this passage found in John chapter 5 and would say, this is not reliable. There is no evidence of a pool of Bethesda. We have archaeological uh, archaeological evidence for so many other things, but this isn't named in any of the antiquities. Josephus, the historian, never refers to this. It is unknown. Therefore, the gospel of John is not reliable. Therefore, the Bible itself is not reliable. A collection of uh, anecdotes, but not inspiration from God himself until 1888. And then all of a sudden, uh, the academic world was amazed that, oh, there is evidence of this, in fact. But they still pushed back and said, but five porches? See, if there's a pool, a basin, a rectangle, there might be a porch along each side, but there's no evidence of like some weird pentagon-shaped pool. How do you get five terraces? So it wasn't until the 1950s as they continued to dig because this was below other structures that have since been constructed, um, other places of worship, that they then found two rectangle basins next to each other. And they realized one was elevated just slightly above the other, allowing the top one to provide the spillover water for the lower one. And in that middle, there was another porch, creating that fifth colonnade. Now, that may be a little bit unnecessary and uninteresting, other than it points to the reality of the reliability of Scripture. That when we look at these details and we examine them intellectually, we examine them archaeologically, if we were to discover something that says this book is actually man-made, then it would question our faith. But evidence like this causes us to have increased confidence that this is a reliable text that we're looking at. So it is at this location where we're told a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. Now, remember, a large number of people are in Jerusalem at this time. 
these two different basins might have normally had two to 300 people around them, uh, but now we're told there's a great number. Uh, Mark will use this phrase, a multitude or a great number, to refer to the feeding of the 4,000, right? 4,000. So get in your mind this idea of thousands of people that are gathered here. Now, something that is controversial is the verse that is follows this. John 5, 3, John 5, 4 is probably not in your Bible. It's actually not in my Bible. It's only a footnote. And at the bottom, it says this verse is deemed to be a later addition to the scripture, but not originally inspired. And verse 5-4 says that at this pool, an angel of the Lord would come and stir the waters, and the first person that got into the water at that time would be healed. Now, likely, this became a cultural phenomenon, a superstitious belief. And that's why biblical scholars say that's not in the origin of the manuscripts. So it's not part of what we hold to our Bible. But it gives us some insight into what was going on at that day. Now, did God use this stirring, perhaps a natural spring? When that uh, bubbled up, did that cause some kind of miracle to occur? It's possible. I mean, we know that God has used some kind of crazy stories to bring about healing. You remember the blind man where Jesus actually spits in the mud and puts mud on his face and he can see? It's not prescriptive. There are other times where God healed blindness through other means. But there's accounts of kind of odd circumstances surrounding uh, divine healing. Perhaps it happened. Perhaps it was just a gathering place for those who were infirmed, who were sick. One who had been there, an invalid, for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and he learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Now, among the thousands, all, or at least most, sick, and some level, Jesus finds this guy, and he knows his story. For 38 years, he's been lying by this pool. Maybe family brought him there and placed him there each morning. Maybe he lived there. We're not quite sure. But 38 years. I mean, that's almost as old as me. That's a long time. <laughs> Just keeping you awake. <laughs> but imagine the mindset 38 years, he goes to this pool, he hopes for some kind of healing, but would your hope sustain over that long period of time? See, his physical ailment would also bring about some mental confusion, some spiritual disappointment. But nonetheless, this is the man, above all the other people, this is the one that Jesus chooses to speak with on this day. Now, there's a great scene in scripture uh, that is recorded for us in a brilliant movie called The Chosen. And here's a short clip that I want you to watch as we try to get ourselves into the mindset of what it would have been like in that day at this time. Let's have a look. Shalom. Me? Yes. Shalom. I have a question for you. For me. I don't have many answers, but I'm listening. Do you want to be healed? Who are you? We'll get to that later. But my question remains. Will you take me to the water? <laughs> Look, 
I'm having a really bad day. You've been having a bad day for a long time. So? Sir, I have no one to help me into the water when it's stirred up. And when I do get close, the others step down in front of me. And so... Look at me. Look at me. That's not what I asked. I'm not asking you about who's helping you, or who's not helping, or who's getting in your way. I'm asking about you. <laughs> I've tried. For a long time, I know. And you don't want false hope again, I understand. But this pool, it has nothing for you. It means nothing. And you know it. But you're still here. Why? I don't know. You don't need this pool. You only need me. So, do you want to be healed? So let's go. Get up. Pick up your mat. And walk. It's a powerful scene, isn't it? Where Jesus embraces, yes. <laughs> Jesus embraces his face, seeing him looking deep into his soul, beyond his ailment. And he says, do you want to be healed? Or do you want to get well? Now, this man is surprised by this. He hasn't really had real hope of being healed, of walking for quite some time. Uh, the video takes some creative license, right? It's not exactly as scripture tells us. There weren't thousands of people, as we know there actually were. Uh, but nonetheless, gives us a great insight into the heart of this man and the heart of Jesus. The text goes on to tell us this. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred, while I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Uh, there's multiple times in which Jesus will heal those who are paralyzed. And yet this one stands unique. Because what we see, the response from this man, is that uh, he is not only physically unwell, but spiritually, mentally as well. Uh, he begins by blaming, shifting. He, he doesn't even answer the question directly. Uh, Jesus will say to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. I'm guessing 38 years of being sick would cause you to think very differently. 38 years of hopeless routine days would affect you your soul, and your mind. Certainly it did with this guy. 
When Jesus asked him a question, he was evasive, wasn't he? He doesn't answer the question. Do you want to be well? Do you want to be healed? He doesn't say yes. He says, every day I come, but other people are there ahead of me. He expresses a mindset of being victimized, not just because of his ailment, but also because no one around pays any attention to him, and he blames everybody else. See, his sickness went beyond the physical. He had become so ingrained in his own tragic tale that he now is passing the blame to other people around him. He is still sick because they don't care, he seems to say. Brokenness. It can come in a lot of forms, right? Sometimes it's obvious physically, and sometimes it is hidden deep within. It can come as a result of time, 38 years in this case of a man facing unanswered prayers, dashed hopes. It can come as a result of disappointment in people. He had that as well. Nobody helps me. My case is worse than theirs. Relational disappointment tears at the very heart of who we are. We can be broken relationally. Lots of ways to be broken, and this man captures a lot of them. I like this quote from Malcolm Muggeridge, who says this, the biggest disease today is the feeling of being unwanted, uncared for, and deserted by everybody. The greatest evil is the lack of love and charity, the terrible indifference toward one's neighbor who lives at the roadside assaulted by exploitation, corruption, poverty, and disease. Amid the brokenness all around, we see that Jesus finds this man, speaks to him, gives him dignity and worth and care. Jesus cares for the broken. And then what we didn't see in the scene that would follow is that Jesus kind of disappears. He makes his way away from this man and the man is left trying to figure out who was that? How did this happen? But then Jesus comes back. The question we want to look at is why? Why does Jesus go back to the now healed man? He will find him then inside the temple. Among presumably still thousands of people, Jesus finds him not just once but twice once to heal his body, and the second time to follow up. Jesus seeks for him, reminds us of this very nature of why Jesus came. Luke tells us the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. The spiritually lost those who may have everything going for them on the outside, a good job, a good family, good looks, good athletic skills, whatever, but still not connected to the God who created them. And so Jesus appears, comes to earth in the form of a man, God incarnate, to seek, to look for, to find, and to save the lost. The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there, and later Jesus found him at the temple. <laughs> Imagine his surprise when now he sees this man. What are the odds that he sees this man that brought healing to his broken legs? Later Jesus found him at the temple, and he said to him, see you are well again, which hints to us that perhaps this was not a tragedy he was born with. He had been well before, and now he's well again. Perhaps it was an accident or a disease or something that came upon him um, at some point in his life, but for 38 years later, he would deal with this paralysis. And he says, see, you are well again, and then what Jesus says now, 
seems rude, (laughs) seems shocking. In this moment of celebration, this man who was walking ably at the temple, inside the temple, maybe for the first time in 38 years, Jesus hunts him down and says, you are well again. But then he asks, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. (laughs) That's rude. Uh, Hey, try this tomorrow. When you go meet a colleague or a friend for lunch, just say, hey, stop sinning or something worse could happen. (laughs) Not a way to make friends. But Jesus isn't there just to be a friend, right? He says, stop sinning. See, what has happened in this man is that he has been physically healed, but he has not looked at the condition of his soul. There's other instances in scripture. In Acts chapter 3, Peter encounters a man who is also paralyzed. And when he is healed, he dances around, celebrates, and gives praise to God. Not so with this man. There's no thanks. There's no praise. There's no recognition of the fact that he is more than simply a body And so Jesus says, hey, your soul, that's what's important. Your soul, you've got to have a covering for your sin. Stop sinning or something worse. He speaks about eternity. And he says, you know, this life is a short time. The condition of your soul is what will matter for all of eternity. And all of us are sinful. This may sound rude, but reality is none of us is perfect. And the definition of sin is simply imperfection. So you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. And unless we have a covering of forgiveness for our sin, we stand guilty before the judge, our God. And Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And so now he has found him, but he's not been saved. And so he says, you've got to ask forgiveness for your sin. You need to invite Christ into your life or something worse, eternity apart from God. That's his mission. See, when Jesus heals, you might be tempted to ask Why only one? If there's thousands, why one? And the point would be that he didn't come just to bring physical healing. His physical healing was a sign of authority that he also had the ability to forgive sins. His miraculous deeds were not just a magic show. They were a display of power over nature, over disease, to let people know that this was God. This wasn't just a good teacher. This wasn't just a winsome prophet. This would be God in the form of man, unique. And so his miracles were to point to the fact that he was the mediator between man and God. And so he says, Don't just settle for physical healing. Stop sinning or something worse may happen. The man went away and he told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. If you saw in the clip, there's Jewish leaders looking on, observing the fact that this healing occurred on the Sabbath. Jesus would break Sabbath law to heal this man. And then he would say to this man, take up your mat and walk. And when he did that, this man also broke Sabbath law. And so this man was guilty in the eyes of the Jewish leaders, as as was Jesus. And so when they come to him and say, who was this guy that healed? He says, I don't know. But then on his own accord, he finds those leaders and he goes and says, I now know who it is. It is Jesus. He healed me. See, he's after his own salvation from the leaders. He's he's protecting himself. He doesn't want to be found guilty by them. He carried his mat. 
And so he says, no, Jesus is the one. It is his fault. He's been blaming people a long time. There's no one here that moves me to the pool. And so it's very natural for him again to say, it was Jesus who healed me on the Sabbath. Go get him. His heart is unchanged. His body is healed, but his soul is still sick. See, most of us love the idea of God changing our circumstances, but not so much God changing us. See, God came to change us. He may or may not intervene in your circumstances. He may or may not heal your physical body. We know that the end result for all of us, 100%, is death, right? At one point, we will give way to some form of physical malady. But along the way, God wants to heal your soul. He wants to cover your sin. He wants for you to experience freedom and forgiveness and understanding of a God that loves you and sent his son Jesus to die for you. It's often easy to get off track, though, isn't it? To want the goodies instead of to worship the giver. To want the blessings of God as opposed to following the character of God. In the same chapter, John chapter 5, Jesus will say these words. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, but you refuse to come to me to have eternal life. See, how easy it is to be religious and to neglect the relationship. How easy it is to learn about God, to not encounter God. Don't settle. Don't settle for an experience of religion. The uniqueness of Christianity is that it offers a relationship. This is not man reaching up to God. It is God reaching down and allowing us to understand who he is through the person of Christ, a relationship with God. Don't settle for religion. See, to be physically healed and spiritually lost is a great tragedy. So much so that Jesus decides to go back into the temple and to search through the thousands of people that were there precisely to worship, to find this man again to say, you're not healed. You look healed, but you're not healed. And to make sure that he understands the fullness of who Christ was and why he came. You remember some of the details. At the very beginning of the story, we're told the location. There is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda. The Sheep Gate, this place where shepherds would bring their sheep, sheep that would then be offered as a sacrifice for the sins of the people, as prescribed by Jewish law. And it would be called Bethesda, that pool, which literally means house of mercy. For this man, it had been a house of misery. But on that day, he would encounter Jesus, the one who could offer the mercy that he needed, the compassion, the dignity, the healing, the eternal life. See, the sheep gate and Bethesda, are significant. Jesus would describe himself as the Lamb of God. With the arrival of Christ and the advent of Christianity, there is no need now for blood sacrifices. There is no need for a sheep to be killed to appease the righteousness of God. Jesus in his crucifixion would do that. He would be the Lamb of God. And he would be the means by which you and I could be given mercy, forgiveness of our sins, 
however great or however small, nonetheless, our sins, which are large enough to distance us from a perfect God. And so it will be this location where the Lamb of God will reveal himself as the merciful one. So let me ask you, where do you need healing in your life? The answer to this can't be, I don't. (laughs) You do. We all do. It might be physical. I encourage you to go to the God who is your healer and to pray for physical healing if that is what you need. But it could also be emotional wounds, scars that you carry, triggers that you have that weigh you down, invisible things that you carry as a burden that God does not want you to carry anymore, to be free, to be healed, to leave that in the past so that you can walk in the freedom that Jesus desires you to have. It might be spiritual healing. Perhaps you've been in and around church or Christians, but you've never come to the point of personally making a decision about your own soul, about recognizing who Jesus is and why he came and what it means for you personally to receive that mercy. But as all Jesus questions are intended for us to look a little deeper I encourage you to look a little deeper and to ask God, where is it that you would want to bring healing into my life? What is it that I'm carrying unnecessarily that you desire to take for me? Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for this story. We thank you for John who recorded it and for your spirit who has preserved it through the ages. We we thank you for the reality of your word and how it speaks to us in such relevant ways. God, we can all be so easily deceived. We can think we are healthy when we're not. We can think we are whole when we are broken. And so God, we thank you that it is not embarrassing or intimidating or threatening for us to admit that we do need healing, that we do need your hand upon us. So spirit, guide us. Teach us, convict us, comfort us. Lead us to a place of wholeness and health and freedom that is found in Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.